My guest at this time is a WWE World Heavyweight Champion and a WWE Hall of Famer. He is Dude Love, Cactus Jack, Mankind, Mrs. Foley's baby boy. It's Mick Foley. Mick, thank you for taking hey, that. <laughs> thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, no problem, Mick. Well, we're going to get into a lot of stuff here, but before we do, you've got a lot of cool stuff going on outside of the ring, and I always love watching because you're, you're a very socially active person, you know. Um, <laughs> What first of all, uh, Mr. Sacco, Mr. Sacco is back. You want to tell the fans a little bit about what you're doing with Sacco at the moment? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, every year I do a super Sacco sale. Uh, just to make it clear, the first year I did it, it was to uh help a Santa whose uh, apartment had burned down to help him find a new location. And I have on you know, I have usually donated some of the money, uh, that was all of the money, some of the money to charity. I haven't decided. So I and mean, this is a for-profit deal is what I'm trying to say. So okay. I don't want people to think that it's a fundraiser. It's, you know, it's a Foley pizza fundraiser, but I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And uh, pro wrestling tees does a great job. Uh, they are my distribution center. I went in and I signed all the socks a couple of weeks ago and uh, you know, for $25, you get the autographed sock with the face on it and a certificate of authenticity. So on one hand, it's just me signing a sock. On the other hand, people love these things. They put them in frames with the certificate. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, anything I think that puts a smile on your face or the face of someone you love during this difficult time is a good thing. Sure. And it's not like we're bending and twisting on everybody's arm, but it's out there and it's a pretty cool item if somebody's looking for that type of thing. I don't know. I think that had I got a Mick Foley sock, like a Socko, as opposed to a rock <laughs> elbow pad, like I think it's I think it goes Socko over elbow pad. Agree, disagree. What do you think? Uh, yeah, because the elbow pad was something he took off. So the elbow pad was actually making the elbow less effective. Oh, got it. Yeah, you. Although I don't think there's anyone among us who wouldn't rather have a game used rock elbow pad than a mankind sock. Does the sock also like suck up moisture, making it easier for you to manipulate <laughs> that nerve underneath the tongue? Is that is that? No, I mean, it just so happened that, uh, you know, honestly, uh, I've said before, you know, you, especially in the attitude era, you're just you were just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. And if you had asked me after the visit with Mr. Sacco in the hospital, if that was something that was going to stick, I go, no, it's one and done. And it wasn't until the next day that Steve Austin was putting it over. He's putting it over so strong. I thought he was ribbing me. I thought he was going to like jump on me as soon as I lowered my guard. I'm like, really, Steve, did you like that? I was like, oh, hell, kid, you're Cactus Jack. What are you doing with a stock puppet? And then he was seeing, she assured me it was one of the funniest things he thought he'd ever seen. And uh, that day, People had signs and uh, they were chanting Sacco's name. And here I am, you know, 23 years later, and we do this yearly worldwide sale and uh, people really enjoy it. Man, I feel like I feel like we're missing out on a Mr. Sacco like animated series. Like I feel like him and Towley from South Park could maybe be friends, you know? <laughs> there was, you know, at one time, one of the guys who did uh, MTV Deathmatch with me wanted to do an animated series with Mankind and the Sock. They liked the way I remember, remember when I was doing celebrity death match in a you know, sound booth. And I said, uh, I, I was against um, uh, geez, great author, Heming Ernest Hemingway. Okay. And they had some great lines in there. You know, I tore off his arms. They said, uh, that's it. Farewell to arms. <laughs> and after I vanquished Hemingway, they said, I guess we know for whom that bell tolls. Like it was really, it was really well written. And I said to them, while I'm doing it, so I'm getting, 100% into the mankind, the really the over the top mankind character sure. uh, version of the character. And uh, I said, how many celebrities do their own voices? And he said, including you. And I said, yes. He said, one. I said, one. And he said, well, not every celebrity finds the humor in it like you do. Like, uh, you know, the, the ability to wink at you, wink and nod and, uh, you know, kind of not take yourself too seriously. Sure. Um, so he did it. Somebody was enthusiastic. It didn't happen. But a, a lot of my post wrestling life has been filled with things that didn't quite happen. Oh, well, and some things that did happen. Some things did happen, for sure, <laughs> some, yeah. Some things did happen. Well, anyway, I love talking about I don't know what it is about Sacco. It just makes me feel, like, nice to hear you talk about Mr. Sacco. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate uh, it. 
you're on cameo too so vince vince hasn't made you sign your cameo over what's going what's going on with you on cameo at the moment? no I, I mean it's a sticky point um you know they're kind of le- letting me be for now um yeah. I, I just did the bump for wwe i'm doing a watch along uh you know, on sunday night so we're all getting along I, I don't think i think it's somewhere they don't want to rock the boat i do i love i go into car i mean I, I love doing them you know one of the things about this um uh pandemic is it's kind of brought on like uh you know like loneliness as uh you know its own pandemic of sorts you know people all alone and uh so uh i found when i was given this opportunity because my wife has a pre-existing condition. So anytime I go anywhere, I've got to, when I come back, I've got to uh, isolate for two weeks. I haven't seen my wife. We have not been without masks around each other since this whole thing started. So it's been difficult. Oh my God. And when you're sitting alone in a hotel room or your house, whoever it may be, it's like, I've got no contact with the outside world, social media. I stopped by my mom's a couple of days a week. And then when I had a chance to do these videos, all of a sudden, I'm not just going, hey, shout out from the hardcore legend. Like, if anyone's seen my cameos, like, I go all out, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I, I, have you seen a few of them? I have. I saw the dude love one re- most recently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I did dude losing his composure on a log flume, which I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Just yesterday, I did a rap battle between man. I, here's dude love and man in a mankind mask. So okay. that's. I, I'm not mankind, right? I'm a man in a mankind mask, but I, I just have a lot of fun doing it. It kind of, uh, it, it, I feel like I'm performing in, as opposed to phoning it in. Well, technically I am phoning it in, but you know what I'm saying? Like I, yeah. I go all out. I try to exceed expectations and I am, a, don't get me wrong. I do appreciate the idea for the first time that I don't have to travel hundreds of miles to make a little money but i also i love doing them like i wake up like all right let me see how many i have okay yeah there might only be two but i'm gonna make these the best two that i can and uh uh let me see what i did to uh, dude love saying anticipation and as i was singing it you know i've got the lyrics up on my tablet i'm like in my head i'm like oh yeah i should have only sang one verse this is going too long so i just called an audible where then dude like oh, oh dude's gotta go and the next thing you know, it's mankind coming on singing a happy birthday or singing uh, wise. Uh, I can't help falling in love with you. So uh, I, I'll have a lot of fun if people want to check out. Just I ask people, just check out the reviews. If you go to cameo.com uh, slash Mick Foley. And, uh, you know, it's not just people saying, hey, great job. I mean people really make it clear that they you know that they enjoyed the videos i will say because i was at your your one-man show SummerSlam weekend last year Mm -hmm. um and uh it was one of the coolest things that i'd ever seen live for you to become mankind again oh yeah where you're on stage and you like manipulate your body and we watch you physically kind of shrink on this stool and become mankind uh, it's a really unique experience watching you get to kind of bring these care. I mean, it's like they never <laughs> left. It's like they never left when you do stuff like that. You know what that does for me, uh, especially in the like if I have an event, I remember uh, doing the 20 years of uh, Hell Tour where they all went really well. Right. You know, as yeah. far as attendance was concerned. And then we had one added in um, as part of Wizard World where they only booked me the night before. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, how do you, how do you, how do you do a show with eight hours notice, you know? So it's one thing if you're sitting by yourself at Wizard World doing the Lonely Virgil because you're only booked the day before. It's another thing when you have a one man show. So I, uh, I asked uh, Glenn Jacobs, you know, Kane, if he would be my special guest, you know, for the Q and A. And as we're walking, I, he goes, you know, how many people do you think will be there? I said, Glenn, there might be 500. There might be five. I don't really know. And as I walk into the room, let's just say it was a lot closer to five than it was uh, 500. Okay. It's everything you don't want in a venue. And what you do want is you know, not with COVID now, you don't want low ceilings, you know, tight crowd, but you want a lower ceilings, good lighting, you know, dark mood lighting, you know, all that kind of uh, seating that fans around the stage. And instead I walk into a massive ballroom with 40 foot ceilings, every light in the place is on. There's like 23 people in a 500 seat room. And all I could think of is, okay, good. 
because it's so much more fun to tell stories about a show where everything did go wrong. You know, if you come out and you go, oh, man, like, let me tell you, the show is packed. Like, there's no fun in that. Right. A lot of boys, you know, they love the guys. You know, they like to tell stories about the time it was sold out. And I, I like to tell the story of the Polka, West Virginia, where there's 26 people. And I could tell because I counted them when I had Shane Douglas in a rear chin lock. Like, those are the fun stories for me to tell. But going back to what you said about mankind. Yeah. Uh, there's 23 people in there and that's kind of like my wake up call instead of being like, Oh God, let me just get through this. If I can get into that character in front of people, I, uh, I, you know, I can bring them the best show I can, no matter who's in front of them. So I remember on that specific show doing that thing where I break out the mankind story and I look at somebody in the audience, they're looking at me like this. I said, you didn't think I was bringing my A game, did you? And they went, no. And I went, oh, I always bring my A game. So uh, the, whole room, the whole room went silent when you did that. I yeah. Was, and people get goosebumps, right? It's kind of crazy. right because... now. Yeah. I'm just thinking <laughs> about it. Yeah. It is. It is cool. Like, I'm glad to hear it from your standpoint, because that's not something I've seen on video. I never did that for a show. Yeah. So I've never seen people. I've never seen what I look like when I do that. <sighs> uh, but I do know that I really enjoy it. And, uh, you know, in, in like in that case, it was 23 people. When I'm doing the cameos now, the mankind you get is usually lighter hearted if he's singing uh, I love songs or whatnot, but he's not quite as intense. Yeah. But I still love the idea of getting into character and uh, and and entertaining. Yeah. Uh, well, what well, you brought up you and Kane here real quick, uh, just to kind of toss it in, you know, it's a real interesting time for The Undertaker, right? Like Mark Calloway mm -hmm. is really shedding this persona for the first time. I know we're going to get a lot of documentaries here very soon. I'm sure you're probably going to pop up in some of these, I would imagine. Um, what's it like for you to be able to finally talk about Mark Calloway <laughs> and like shed the mystique of The Undertaker? This is a new time uh, for everybody, you know? Nick, I like the mystique. Uh I do. And I try to keep a mystique around it. Uh, even, even though it's okay to talk about the man behind, uh, you know, behind the character, he is in some ways the character and there is an aura around him. And so I don't know the undertaker. I don't know Mark as well as I do now, as well as I did in 1990 when I used to travel with him. And I kind of like it that way. And it kind of, you know, when I was mankind going up against the undertaker, there was that aura every night. I talked about this in my um, uh, hall of fame acceptance speech that every night when I was with Paul bear and the undertaker's music would go off, I would do what you just did. Uh, I would show off the hairs on my arm standing on end. And Paul bear would roll up his sleeves and his hairs would be standing on end. There was never a night when it felt like, a job it was always an honor so i prefer to treat that character you know with reverence I'm, I'm glad he's breaking out because he wants to live a regular life he's got a great wife he's got at least one child i think uh, one small i know he has more children but one small child okay uh that he's raising right now gunner i believe is noel's age 20 uh, 26 okay um and then he has another child uh, that i have not met but it's great that he's able to do that and have a great family life and, you know, not feel like anytime someone sees him and takes a photo, it's like, ah, oh, the undertaker's hair is graying. Like, Oh yeah. It's been graying for a while now, you know, like yeah. he's not, he doesn't have to worry about that type of thing. Yeah. And what do you think? One more match for taker? Would you, would you say yay or nay? What's your opinion? I don't know. You know what? If you follow the, uh, uh, the, the taker uh, documentary series, he was always looking for that last great way to go out. And he had that at WrestleMania. So I don't know how you possibly top that. Um, but, it, you know, it's his it's his life. And if he feels like he's got another great one left in the tank, then he should do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, the other one, you know, obviously Undertaker is going to be a Hall of Famer someday. You're a Hall of Famer. Uh, one thing I did want to ask you about is a lot of people have been surprised by how outspoken you've been against fellow Hall of Famer Donald Trump as of late. Uh, why have you <laughs> felt the need to most a lot of wrestlers don't get as political as you've gotten? Recently. Yeah. Why have you felt the reason to be so outspoken about this? Yeah, I did not intend to, to get political. I was political in uh, 2003, 2004. I debated JBL on World News Tonight on ABC Live. Uh, and I thought we both accounted for ourselves pretty well. 
I just stay, you know, then I kind of, you know, as soon as the, um, as soon as the major issue became the economy, when it fell apart in 2008, I was like, well, I don't know. I could not tell you to this day what a credit default swap is, which was the major uh, reason the economy fell apart. Like I, I just, I can't tell you no matter how many times I read it, I don't understand it. Uh, I'm not at the end passionate about it. Okay. Um, but in this case, yeah, yeah, you just, I just see so many things going wrong um, from, and I know that pro- obviously the president has his fans out there and I realized and, um, you know, overnight I lost 50,000 followers at one point, just because wow. I suggested that maybe there should be witnesses at a trial. So I understand, you know, especially when I'm in some rural areas and signing autographs, there's a bunch of great people, you know, they're good people, hardworking people who probably don't feel the same way about the president that I do. And I understand that. And I would hate to lose some of them, uh, let alone, you know, 50, 100,000. That was 50,000 overnight. Man. Um, but I thought, you know, the, the two dirtiest words in the English language are what if. Uh, I always felt that way, whether it was saying, hey, what if I don't want to be that guy saying what if 10 years from now laying on my couch saying I could have gone out there on stage. I could have worked on it. I could have brought a show alive, you know, so I did my best to do that. And I, I swear, I don't want a moment where I what if I had done something different? You know, what if this president wins by 200 votes, you know, in one state and pushes the electoral college over the line. And I just thought if you've got the power to do something and you don't do it because you're worried about uh, making, you know, losing some Twitter followers, then you haven't, you know, you maybe don't have your priorities in order. I just thought this was an extreme time. Everything from a president of the United States with 80 million followers openly mocking someone like Elijah Wood after his house was broken into to mocking Debbie Dingle about her husband who had just passed away. He's just a mean guy. Uh, and I, and I, I just see so many issues with it. You don't, you don't force uh, that now I'm going to start whining because you could live. I literally bought a scroll so that if I was asked, you're like, well, what's your issue? Because if it's one issue, then it's easy to bring up. If it's 200 issues, then it becomes, you know, and literally you come up with 200 things without having to work too hard things that weren't right with this administration. I want to just roll it out and go, do you want me to start alphabetically, chronologically, sure. you name it. But just in the past few days, like threatening to fire your FBI guy, if he doesn't give you the information you want, like, I don't think he understands that they don't work for him. He works for us. The FBI works for us. They're not at like the Comey thing made that clear. That's like, you're not supposed to be close with your FBI guy. He's supposed to give you independent information. Uh, so every step of the way from, I, you know, from, from naming the, uh, the, the lead juror in a case, like outwardly shaming the guy on his Twitter to like, to, just, let me just, I know I'm jumping all around, but no, that's fine. Take your time. you were, if you were to see a guy, just a guy mocking somebody for having their house broken into what would be a word you would use to describe that guy uh, uh, heartless heartless jerk right uh, db you know you name it now if that same guy has 80 million followers who are going to change the life of that person you're mocking uh, who are going to make their life a living hell then that's just a person of indescribable cruelty so when the president says like oh i retweet i don't tweet you know, for example, when I got off Twitter, here's my big uh, um, exclusive for you guys. I got off Twitter for six weeks a while back, and there were two things that did it. It was uh, uh, the death of uh, the young lady in Japan by suicide due to bullying. Yeah. Uh, Kimura was her last name, I think. Yeah, Kimura, yeah. And the other one was the president retweeted something by the uh, uh, Republican cowboys. I have their names written down somewhere where the guy said, the only good Democrat is a dead Democrat. And then immediately goes, I know they're going to try to take my words out of context. And I was like, no, no, wait, I make a living using words. Like those words are always meant to be taken literally. 
they were from the time a former Civil War general was told by a Native American in 1869 that there are some good Indians out there. And the guy said, well, the only good Indians I've seen are dead Indians. And then they got taken into the only good Indian is a dead Indian. The only good, you name it, the only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. The only good, it's meant to be taken literally. Right. And I thought this guy has set the bar so low for civility that that particular wheat tree didn't even get a, a considerable amount of attention. And I just thought, how far have we fallen that a president could retweet that and say, hey, see you in New Mexico or see you in November. And I thought, well, he's got 80 million followers. I think as a guy who uses words and has written 11 books and been a pretty effective communicator, even without my bottom teeth, that though those words are meant to be taken literally. Now you've got a guy who's saying, who's, who by hitting retweet, you are, you know, you are endorsing that viewpoint. You can't say you're just putting it out there. When you're the president of the United States and you retweet something, you are endorsing it. So if you got 80 million followers, you just do the math. It's like, okay, what if one in a hundred took you literally about the possibility of killing Democrats? Now you, you know, do the math, right? You've got, so you've got uh, 800,000 potential people taking that seriously. What if it's one in a thousand? You get down to all you need is eight people with rifles and they can terrorize a nation based on what one guy said. And if I was, people go, hey, you aren't taking this too far? I go, no, no, like I did some studying, you know, like on Rwanda, they killed 750,000 people with 250,000 machetes not a single gunshot. And we've got a nation armed to the teeth and we've got a guy fomenting violence, asking white nationalist groups to stand back and stand by uh, using you know, coded language to let them know that uh, you're gonna be okay. Like you can go and say four days later that you, uh, uh, that you condemn white uh, nationalism, but they know. They know as soon as they hear stand back and stand by, that they can do whatever they want and the president's going to look the other way. So I think it's a, I just think it's a really dangerous situation. I didn't try, I barely chimed in, uh, in 2000, in 2008, I did, I had something to say. I was, I was a big Obama supporter. Sure. 2012, I stood back. I don't know if I even tweeted about it. I may have once or twice. 2016, I warned people not to do what I think they were about to do which they did. Yeah. And uh, this time around, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I haven't heard a single, I've never heard him express concern about the environment. I've never heard him talk about global warming. I have never heard him condemn Putin for the possibility that he put bounties on our service members in Afghanistan. I've never heard him express concern that Putin's uh, leading rival was poisoned. Uh, he said he'd look into it. Does anyone really believe he looked into it? No, no. Uh, I believe he's compromised. If he's not compromised, he does a good job of acting like somebody who's compromised. And I just thought, you know, again, 20 years from now, if someone asked me what I did, because I do believe we'll be studying this in history, how things went terribly wrong and things go terribly wrong when good people do nothing. So, yeah. And um, I, I hate to cut you off, Mike. I know I only have like a, a like a few minutes left here because you have to go get your teeth worked on, and we all want your teeth to be very, very healthy. Yeah, I lost my flipper. It's I, not. I, I, eventually, Doctor Britt Baker is going to do the uh, is go, is going to do the uh, the dental work, and that's a story in and of itself. But this is just a case of me losing the flipper, and fortunately, I'm in a position where I can go on with my life with this smile because it, all it is is a unique reminder of that match with the Undertaker. Sure. Um, uh, but so I do have to do that shortly. And I have a bird, man, I was looking out a little bit earlier. I was like, there's a cat attack. Ah, and I rushed out and uh, I rescued the bird. It's a morning dove. It's in a box. And so I um, rescued a dove this morning. Rick? You're damn right. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Christ, you're wonderful. And now I'm going to bring it to the nature center. I did that a bunch of years ago, my son, Mickey, uh, this is 10 years ago. So he was like nine. He found uh, these birds that had fallen out of a nest in a storm and they were like, they were tiny, you know? 
and uh, we ended up taking him to the nature center and he visited them every week. We visited them as they were uh, rehabilitated. And then the nature center gave us, they were robins. You couldn't even tell what they were, but four, three months, whatever the case is, they gave them to us in a box and we were able to set them free. And uh, there's a video of me singing born free wow. somewhere out there. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's a wonderful. I will make that rescue. I will make that rescue. Yeah. I will rescue animals. <laughs> That's sure, an incredible anecdote. You're a wonderful human being, Nick. Um, the, the question I would ask you was, I guess the million dollar questions, a lot of wrestling fans would ask when they see you say these things is like, you know, Vince and Linda are, you know, very, very close with the president. Linda going right. as far as to like being in the administration. Does that affect the relationship? Do you worry about it affecting the relationship? How does Vince and Linda view the politics of the people that <laughs> are in their orbit? I mean, what is that like being in that space? Well, I think Vince has respected my uh, viewpoint for a couple decades now. I don't think he deep down wants everybody to agree with him just because he's Mr. McMahon. Yeah. Um, you know, I can honestly say I haven't lost a sing single friend in wrestling. I went and campaigned for Glenn Jacobs, you know, um, because I think Glenn is a really good man. And uh, that's what we should be. I tweeted out something yesterday showing a, uh, uh, a state. It was a state race, not a national race. Uh, may have even been a local race, but it was two competitors, a uh, Republican and a Democrat who had very different views for their area of Vermont. And then after their a debate, uh, the, the one guy broke out a guitar, the woman, the Democrat broke out a cello and they did a duet. And I was, and I tweeted, that's the America I want to live in. You know, uh, uh, we shouldn't be at each other's throats because we think differently. I, I just, but in my opinion, this guy, the president of the United States having uh, unfettered access to the public for the past five years you know it's it's it, to me it's a not so subtle form of brainwashing to just come out and repeat the same mantras over and over whether it's perfect letter you know the the perfect letter uh rounding the corner hoax and uh i think you know he what he has done to this country in terms of just dividing us over a mask is you know it's it's really sad i think where the people are going to look back on history and go wait a second you could have saved a hundred thousand lives and didn't because people didn't want to wear a mask and that's why i put out a video that really resonated it went over a million views the only time i've had anything remotely close to a million views about wearing a mask despite the fact that it's not comfortable and the key line there was i i wear it because I care more about your safety than I do about my comfort. And I wish that more people felt the same way about me. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot riding on this election and I don't want to be the guy saying I could have, I should have, I would have, I want to be the guy who does. Sure. All right. Well, Mick, uh, I sincerely thank you for the time. Uh, you, uh, I know Noel, I'm friends with Frank. I hear she's doing better. By the way, Frank, the clown man, he's like part of the business now. Right. Frank's doing really well. You know, I think uh, uh, subjecting themselves uh, to <laughs> Joey Janela's moves. That, El that, that avalanche tombstone. I sent you that thing, man. That was crazy. Yeah, you sent it to me. Yeah. And then I saw uh, Joey leg dropping Frank off of uh, a goalpost. Yes. And yes. so he's down there. You know, I worry about Frank that someone won't take care of him. And he said, you know, he's known Joey. He felt confident. But Frank gets heat. You know, and he takes bumps and, uh, yeah. you know, he, uh, you know, he's, he's really doing well. He's a good promo guy, a good guy. Yeah. So I'm happy he's getting some attention. Good. And yeah, Dewey, I guess, running 205 Live now, right? Or something like that. Yeah, he is. Yeah, Dewey. Uh, I know that I've heard from some people high up in the uh, food chain there in WWE that they really like his work. So good. He, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So. All right. Well, Mick, I'll let you get off to the dentist here. I know the last thing we didn't get to, uh, to bring up at the top was, you have this uh, high spots uh, hour long signing coming up. Do you want to close out oh, yeah. talking a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just did one uh, with uh, K and S and a uh, big credit to, uh, you know, just the fans, the wrestling. And I want to say the industry, just finding a way to keep going uh, despite the hardships and uh, to everyone who cares enough to allow us to do virtual signings. I mean, this is, it's so much fun. Uh, so I believe uh, 
I'm not only going to be doing a signing, I believe I'm going to be hosting. I don't want to give away too much, but I'm going to be there for a while above and beyond my virtual signing, but that's on October 31st. It should be fun. I'm moving in a week. And so I've been going through storage. Yeah. Leaving Long Island for good. And I'm finding like a treasure trove of great stuff, memorabilia. You like the vet, the flannel vest I wore in the WrestleMania 2000 match, the, the red and black flannel I wore against Triple H oh. in the Hell in a Cell. Just a lot of cool stuff. My second pair of boots. Uh, so people might be on the lookout for auctions later on down the line. But I really want to thank everyone who cares enough, like I said, uh, to do the cameos, to, to do these virtual signings. It's really, uh, I, I really feel fortunate to have fans like all of you out there.